Last week, I did a video about a guy who remained pretty infamous in our history. No, not this guy, this guy. And while his story was relevant and worth learning from, Columbus has already a lot of literature and media spreading his name around. While in the meantime, people that have made contributions to humankind, that have saved lives and have challenged the norms of their times, are sometimes ignored by history and the general public. Well, here's hoping that today's video will make a difference. This is the story of Alice Hamilton. Look around, look around. No, not Alexander Hamilton's wife. Not even a relative of his. Alice Hamilton is a woman who made a name for herself in the scientific community, who saved a great deal of lives, and whose story is worth preserving and passing on. Hi, my name is Alex Claude, and this is Our Story, the series where we unpack stories of science and human history in order to better understand our past, present, and future. If you're new here, please make sure to subscribe. I make videos like these every week, so make sure to not miss out on the next stories. Like I've said, today's story is about Alice Hamilton. Her story, as well as many stories of women in science, don't really reach mainstream status. Unless, of course, a Hollywood studio decides to make a movie out of it. Now, I am no Hollywood studio, but who knows, maybe this video will help. Alice Hamilton came from a family of Irish immigrants that moved to the US in the 1800s. Immigrants, we get the job done! Even though she could have been well off just from her inherited wealth, she decided to support herself financially. She was inspired to pursue medicine after reading a book called The Merv Oasis. This was a personal account of a British war correspondent that went to Persia for three years and detailed everything that was going on over there. Soon after, she graduated University of Michigan Medical School in 1893, and for two years after that, she did several internships at hospitals in Minneapolis and Boston. She soon realized that she wasn't really that interested in establishing a medical practice. So she came back to the University of Michigan and decided to study bacteriology and to also become a lab assistant. Her ambitions grew bigger, and so she decided to study abroad for a year in Germany alongside her sister, Edith. But since we're still talking about the 19th century, things didn't really go that well. Sure, in Frankfurt she had a pretty warm welcome, but in Berlin her studies were rejected, and while in Munich and Leipzig, she and her sister had to face a great deal of prejudice. Nevertheless, she returned to the US a year later, all but motivated to continue her studies as a postgraduate at John Hopkins University Medical School. In 1897, she decided to move to Chicago and soon became a member of the Hull House, a settlement house that was founded eight years before. To give you some context, settlement houses were part of a reformist social movement that wanted to bring the rich and the poor together under the same roof. These settlement houses were usually found in the poor urban areas, where you would have middle-class volunteer settlement workers that would live there, they would share their knowledge and culture, and hopefully this way they would alleviate the poverty of their low-income neighbors. Alice volunteered at Hull House to teach English and art, and she remained a resident there for over 22 years. Her first big contribution to science and medicine was in 1904, while working at the Memorial Institute for Infectious Diseases in Chicago. She was investigating the spread of strep throat disease among the patients. She quickly realized that part of the reason was because doctors and nurses were spreading it around through the droplets coming out of their mouths during surgeries. So her study concluded that from this point forward, doctors and nurses should protect their faces while performing an operation. So yeah, she was the one who made wearing face masks during surgery a thing in a medical community. And that has saved countless lives ever since. So yeah, now you know who to thank for that or who to hate. I'm pretty sure you'll let me know in the comments. But this was far from one of her greatest achievements. Her career took off in 1910, when she became a medical investigator for the Illinois Commission on Occupational Diseases. She led several investigations on work safety and industrial poisons, and her work managed to help pass compensation laws for people that were exposed to dangerous toxins, and it also forced employers to take safety measures to protect their workers' health. Please take a moment to let that sink in. Things that we consider today commonplace, doctors wearing face masks, employers taking care of your health, these are not really more than a hundred years old. 
And in fact, it took a lot more time for this to be implemented all across the globe. Damn, living in the beginning of the 20th century really wasn't all that fun. By 1916, Alice Hamilton became the leading authority on lead poisoning. She was in charge of many investigations on the effects of mercury, carbon monoxide, tetraethyl lead, barium, benzene, carbon disulfide, and hydrogen sulfide gases. Because apparently these were pretty common in the workplace back then. And in 1925, at a public health service conference, she testified against the idea of using lead in gasoline, given the danger it would pose to people's health and to the environment. Unfortunately, her viewpoint was ignored and lead was allowed to be used in gasoline. Unfortunately, it would take 75 more years for us to completely phase out the use of leaded gasoline across the world. In the meantime, in the US alone, it was reported that due to using lead gasoline for over 60 years, 68 million children suffered from high toxic exposure to lead. Unfortunately, this was not the first and not the last time we didn't listen to the warnings of scientists. The subject of us using leaded gasoline requires a whole video in it and of itself, but if you want to find out more about it, there's an episode in the Cosmos series with Neil deGrasse Tyson that covers this subject in detail. I highly recommend checking it out. Alice Hamilton's research has influenced a great deal of health reform when it comes to worker safety. This is partly why in most developed and developing countries around the world, people don't suffer or die from exposure to carbon monoxide, mercury, or TNT. Alice also became the first female faculty member at Harvard in 1919, and for six years she was the only woman member of the League of Nations Health Committee. When accepting her job as assistant professor at Harvard, she mentioned, yes, I am the first woman at Harvard faculty, but I am far from the first woman that should have been appointed. Alice Hamilton is an icon maybe in our eyes today, but during her life she had to face a great deal of discrimination and prejudice for being a woman of science. During her 16 years at Harvard, she never received a promotion. And she soon realized it was better off for her to teach only for one semester so she could dedicate more time for her research and also to spend a few months every year at the whole house. She couldn't join the Harvard Union, she couldn't attend the faculty club, and she couldn't even march in the commencement ceremonies just like everyone else did. This kind of goes to show that being at Harvard back then didn't really make you less of a misogynist. Alice retired in 1935 and lived all the way to 101 years old until she sadly passed away on the 22nd of September 1970 in her home in Connecticut. Alice Hamilton's life has left an important legacy. And luckily, the world did not forget her contribution entirely. The US Postal Service issued a stamp with her face on it, and every year there are still awards that bear her name. We need more stories like hers, and we need to preserve them. Most of the times, the real heroes of our times don't get the accolades and the press that they deserve. And her story reminds us that no matter how small we may feel, our contribution matters. And Contributing to the well-being of other people is probably one of the most human things there is. We care about each other, we live and we die by each other's side, and we feel an immense sense of purpose when we contribute to the well-being of other people. We might not receive the public accolades at first, in fact, we might receive the exact opposite, but our actions ripple in time. And they lay the groundwork for future generations the same way Alice's work has laid the groundwork for our generation. So here is my question to you. How are you making other people's lives better? How are you contributing to the advancements of our species? Or how are you supporting the well-being of your community? And if you are not, how would you like to do that one day? Think about it and let me know in the comments. Thank you so much once again for tuning in. Today's video was a little longer than usual, but I hope you enjoyed it. I for one enjoyed making it. Give a thumbs up, leave a comment, and subscribe if this is your first time here. And if you like these videos, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. You can get access to behind the scenes footage, early access to videos, and many more fun perks. I'll leave a link for you to discover them in the description. My name is Alex Claude, your neighborhood storyteller, and this is our story. See you next week. Take care.